Hey, and welcome back to the VSI webinar series. Today, today we're delighted to welcome three-time Olympian Goldie Sayers onto the platform who will be in debate with uh, Dr. Ian Lawrence about the critical factors that athletes face during transition from competing into the next stage of their careers. So we're looking forward to a, an interesting uh, debate and, and, and a hot topic presently with a lot of athletes that are coming to the end of their competitive careers. As normal, before we start, I'm going to hand over to Tim and Tim will explain how you can write your questions into the box before handing over to Ian to kick off the interview with Goldie. Tim? Cool, thanks Tony. Um, as always, if you're on YouTube, um, you asking questions is a bit futile because it's not going to come through to us. If you're one of the 25 delegates that's logged into Zoom, then you're the lucky ones. Use the Q&A or the, um, the chat box at the bottom to ask your questions. And if it's relevant, we will we'll ask those at the end. And if time permits, we'll even unmute you so you can come on and ask your own question, providing it's uh, all up board. So without further ado, um, I can pass this over to the uh, amazing Ian Lawrence, who is, uh, as we speak, in a loft somewhere in the middle of uh, nowhere and still managed to find a uh, Wi-Fi signal. Just incredible, just incredible, Ian. Go for it. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. It's great to have the opportunity to chat with Goldie today. Goldie was born in Newmarket, next birthday around the corner. Goldie played hockey, netball and tennis at county level, champion table tennis player at under 11s. But what Goldie is probably best known for are her achievements as a three times Olympian, British record holder and 11 time UK champion at Javelin. And to bring things pretty much up to date, post athletics career, Goldie set up her own successful property investment development business called Athlete Property Investment Limited and recently completed her MSc in Sporting Directorship with VSI and the University of Salford. And we'll have a chat about Goldie's MSc project in a few minutes, but I guess the good question to start with would be, how did you initially get into sports, Goldie? Because it wasn't javelin from day one, was it? No, I'm not, hopefully not on mute, no. Um, hello, everybody, first of all. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Um, so in terms of my sporting career, I was very much a team sport, Kind of ball games player and from quite an early age I always wanted to play for my country at sport and at the time I was a county hockey netball tennis player and national under 11 table tennis champion um, but athletics was the one sport I actually didn't particularly enjoy because I was always running and jumping and um, but I could always throw a ball a long way so then school asked me to compete for them in the summer term and actually handed me a jab and to take home over the school Easter holidays which wouldn't happen now for health and safety but I'm glad it did and that's really where my kind of athletics career took off. I, I met a good coach quite early um, so progressed technically quite quickly and then specialised so stopped playing team sports etc at 18 so I did actually play all sport pretty much until I was 18 when I specialized which is relatively late nowadays I guess but um and then went to my first sort of senior international championships and first Olympic games when I was about 21 22 um and did a lot of junior championships so that was really the start of it. Javelin is quite an unusual sport isn't it it's not your stereotypical sport that kids necessarily orientate towards. What was it about the coach? Was the coach particularly, I don't know, charismatic, enthusiastic? What was it about Javelin that, that grabbed your attention? Yeah, it's a very, it's a challenging event. So I think that's what I love the most. I enjoyed the challenge of it. So it's very, very skillful. It looks perhaps to the uninitiated as just brute force, but it, it very much isn't. It's about coordination, timing, speed, um, power, Flexibility is crucial. Um, so actually the ball games that I played and spatial awareness really helped me. Um, and I had a good, a good coach, he was very, very positive and he had a group of athletes who um, were, you know, ranged from beginners right up to kind of senior international athletes. So I, I was training with a lot of people which made it fun. So there was kind of, I guess, a bit of a team um, dynamic to it, but he was definitely a very positive coach and I wasn't particularly pushed necessarily. I just had this desire to get better. And I guess the difference between team sports and individual sports is it you get selected because you've done a distance or you haven't, you know, there's no 
kind of subjectivity and selection it's very objective so I guess I kind of enjoyed that aspect of it because in team sport trials I was often going for trials and I had a brown ponytail and looked like everybody else and um or just wasn't good enough um so so yeah it, it did it did the challenge of it certainly appealed to me what were your parents involvement in this in terms of uh, sounds like you had a great coach but parents are obviously very important in terms of that support network were, were they very encouraging and supportive of you have you been involved in javelin yeah no absolutely i had definitely had parents whose motto or certainly my mum was very much you know just do what you enjoy that's what she's always said which is lucky um i mean i was very very self-motivated so i didn't really need pushing but you obviously need parents who will travel to you know competitions and training with you and actually i was training about 40 minutes away from where i lived um so yeah they were very very supportive my dad was a musician and always you know notoriously hated sports <laughs> but understood the performance side of it um so um so yeah they, they were very very supportive but but really not very involved so which i think looking back was probably a good thing but very encouraging of whatever i wanted to kind of take part in they were there to i guess ferry me around but didn't get involved in my career at all luckily <laughs> I think one of the problems with sport and particularly for kids is that they seem to, seem to attract parents who almost live vicariously through their kids on the sidelines. Well, what, what are your thoughts about parent, parental involvement in sport and how they challenge and support their kids? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, my parents certainly weren't at all pushy and wouldn't certainly wouldn't shout from the sidelines, partly because my dad wouldn't know what he was looking at to shout. So, um, but I think it, there is a there's there's two sides to it. I was very very self motivated, so didn't need pushing. But then, you know, say actually my brother, for example, was very good at sport, but wasn't particularly competitive, so possibly needed a push. So I guess it's like anybody's motivation, whatever their motivation is. For some kids, it can be the social aspect of you know going to an athletics club. It's not about competition. For me, it was about mastery. So and I guess autonomy a bit and. So I think for parents, it's mostly trying to identify what it is their child is motivated by. Um, because for somebody who isn't, you know, wildly competitive, but just enjoys the training and being around friends, then that kind of is something to bear in mind, not to push them too hard. But I do, I am aware of, you know, having played a lot of tennis, parents who, you know, very much are wanting to push their kids and think, you know, that's their route to kind of riches, basically. But um, I've not seen that many push, pushy parents whose kids have been particularly successful or if they have been successful they've not necessarily enjoyed it and um, I'm not sure what you know you've got to think about what you're trying to achieve. So what, what was the, the tipping point where you actually realised that yes I've got a future in Javelin and a potential career? Was, it, was there a key moment that was the, 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 the real moment where epiphany where you thought yeah I can actually take this seriously and do something with it? Um, I guess through the age groups, I was competing internationally, but I never really thought I, you know, would make a living out of it. I guess when I had my first um, senior Great Britain International, I would have been about 20. Um, and then going to my first Olympic Games, I guess that was the moment where I thought, you know, I could do this or I'm good enough to do this professionally. But, um, you know, I was still at university then, which helped. So it meant that I wasn't, you know, starting work. So it, I guess it progressed on for that from there. But yeah, certainly the Olympic Games, I totally got the bug and thought, you know, this is where I want to be and I'll do everything I can to improve and um, go to the next one and, you know, hopefully medal at the next one. You, you did well at university, at Loughborough University. I think you got a first, didn't you, in exercise science or something related in that area. Was it difficult to, to balance both your athletics career and your academic career at the same time? Um, a little bit. I think they will say at university you either, you can only do two things, two out of three things well, that being, you know, socialising, sport and studying. And um, I think I've not taken my A-levels as seriously as I could have done. So I, um, I decided that, you know, I want to try and get a first if I can. I think I scraped one by sort of 1%. Um, I think the reason I managed to do well is because the university were very um, kind of supportive of having a sporting career as well as the academia. So I split my final year. So the 2004 Olympics were in my final year. So I was able to split my final year over two years. 
which certainly helped. Um, so then it made that year very manageable, really. And I think that was probably the reason I did did well, because I don't remember working as, as perhaps as hard as I could have done, but that was mainly because my focus was sport by that stage. So at what stage do you actually start planning your future career? Because retirement from, from elite sport is inevitable. It's going to happen to everybody at some stage. And in some cases, it's going to be forced early upon individuals. So did you receive some advice or how did you look into your crystal ball and anticipate what was around the corner? Um, I think I used within Olympic sport, you've got the English Institute of Sport that kind of provides performance lifestyle advice. So that's, you know, looking at your future and your life, I guess, outside of sport. And I'd always throughout my career I'd done a bit of coaching. I'd always done some kind of motivational speaking work. And actually, interestingly, which led on to what I'm doing now in my property business, I'd move for training quite regularly. So I'd always kept hold of those properties. So I think when I retired, I effectively became a, an accidental landlord. Um, and I don't think, because it's easy to say, you know, plan early for retirement. And I would advocate that. But I was somebody who was very focused on trying to be the best I could be in my sport. But I think what perhaps helped me was that I had other interests and was doing other things so whether that was studying or doing I do random courses just to be around kind of normal people um, so I'd always done other things which I think helped so I could find things that I was interested in and I always advocate to young athletes even if you're not academic and don't want to go down that route just have some interests that balance your kind of life a little bit away from sport so and also, in addition to that, I was sitting on Athlete Commission, so the British Olympic Association Athlete Commission I was on for eight years. So I was constantly around people who had retired and they were some of our most successful ever Olympians. And they'd always talked about retirement being really difficult and, um, you know, effectively how hard it was. So I was eight years before I retired thinking, well, this is going to be awful. And actually when it happened, it then wasn't. And I think that was mainly um just having a level of awareness that you know it's not as easy as um it might appear so um whilst i didn't plan everything i think i put a few things in place maybe five years or so before retiring but not necessarily a job to walk straight into but you know i didn't feel like i'd only just been an athlete certainly when i retired i suppose from the outside looking in it's for somebody like myself who's not been involved in elite sport at the kind of levels that, that you guys have, it's kind of inevitable that athletes will prioritise their training over outside interests and become very focused on this, on planning towards winning. Is there something better that national governing bodies could do, federations could do in terms of raising awareness or structuring that kind of career planning in at a much earlier age? I think that they're definitely starting to um, anyway. And the, the, the thing is, it's, it's a two way process, really. It has to come from, you know, there's a level of a sport that has to come from the governing body. But there is also, um, you know, the, the athlete has to be open to use that support. I mean, I found certainly in my research that those who use the support on offer tended to transition better than those athletes who didn't use the support. Um, I mean, I can only sport, speak from an Olympic sport perspective, but having interviewed rugby players and, you know, the RPA and um, I just know from friends in cricket, so the PCA, et cetera, there is support there. Um, certainly the research revealed that athletes really, whilst they really um, appreciated the practical support, it was the emotional kind of journey or, or support that they sort of needed when they were going through their transition probably more so um so and that when they tended to need the support was generally when it had stopped so maybe it might be a year two years into their retirement and obviously sports have a duty of care but it's kind of how long should that duty of care last i think is a question and they have in olympic sport extended the the um, performance lifestyle support but often people don't know they need it until you know a year or two into retirement some athletes appear to, to handle that transition better than others I mean, you hear cases of um, impact upon their married lives upon depression upon 
um, some people resorting to alcohol as, as a crutch to help them make that transition. What, what was it like for you initially when you first retired? Was it, was it something that you were able to move positively through and what were the reasons for that? Um, it, was, it was challenging, but I think the difference with my retirement, or the difference, but a positive factor in mine was that it was chosen. So I knew when I was going to retire, I knew that it was going to be in 2016. I was trying to compete or qualify for my fourth Olympics, which I didn't manage to do, but I effectively, I knew what my last competition was going to be. So when I was competing in it, I kind of knew that was the last time I'd ever compete for Great Britain, which was great, actually. Um, and so I guess I'd had a gradual kind of transition out of the sport mentally as much as anything. But I mean, I, can, I basically retired because, you know, old injuries were kind of affecting performance and, and I effectively wasn't able to perform how I used to be able to with ease. So it started to not become fun anymore. And, you know, I had to, you know, I found training a bit more difficult motivationally. Um, but, you know, when I went through the research projects and actually looked at the reasons that people, um, you know, struggle with their retirement or the, the things that help you in retirement, I'd done a lot of those things, which is why I think my experience was possibly a little bit more positive than many friends who I interviewed and people I'd spoken to around um, retiring from sport. So it is different for everybody, but everybody does find it a challenge. I mean, I did, I felt quite anxious when I retired because I think you feel like time is running out a little bit because you're doing, you're perhaps going into a new career at an age when most people have got 10, 15 years experience. So you might feel a little bit left behind, but you do have a lot of skills that a lot of people who haven't had a sporting career um, don't necessarily have. Something I found really interesting looking through your thesis was you use the, the terms loss of identity and status that tend to you know, happen when you retire. Was that a key thing for yourself in your own circumstances that you felt this loss of status because your identity was so wrapped up in being an athlete and being so successful as an athlete? Um, it's difficult. I don't think, um, not necessarily. I think the identity, it's more that for me anyway, it was more the identity piece. I think the status, I guess, I probably possibly had a higher status earlier in my career. And then as performances declined in a way that might have been a good thing. So my status was probably 50% of what it was <laughs> sort of six years previous. Um, but certainly the identity piece, the um, research I did, often the question so what are you doing now was one of the most stressful questions for people because they couldn't you know they didn't have an answer so I remember a rower saying to me you know I was a rower for 20 years and that was my identity and if people asked me what I did that's what my answer was and so I had an answer for 20 years and now I don't have an answer and a lot of athletes tended to say that was a real challenge so it was more that the, the huge challenge was tr just trying to find a career that had as much purpose as sport had for those athletes. So I think loss of identity is certainly the kind of number one factor that seems to be challenging for most people, especially if they've been an athlete from, you know, 16 and they've never, you know, done anything else. It was very much who they were and how people would introduce them to friends and what they were known for. Um, and especially if people hadn't got other areas that you know were of interest or other interest in their life, then once their career stopped, their kind of identity seemed to stop with it, and they didn't really know who they were outside of sport. Again, from the outside, I think athletes, from my perspective, seem to have this demeanor where they project strength and confidence. Does that make it difficult then if you're projecting those kind of values and that's your demeanor to then actually go and ask for help? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, you're, you're almost trained to not show any sign of weakness. And, and that's what a lot of the interviewees said that when they actually needed help when they retired, um, whether it's mental health support or just help in general with retirement, they weren't very good at asking for it. So, or they didn't really know how. Um, and that became a bit of a challenge. And actually one hockey player said, I remember him saying that, you know, he wished he'd been better asking for help in his career because he thinks that would have made him a better hockey player. 
Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, that it's, it's definitely a, a significant factor in the ability to ask for help and actually people, their perceived level of support actually was one of the biggest factors. If they felt like they had help, then they felt more comfortable, um, which, whereas some had a lot of help, but they didn't feel like they were supported. And that, that was definitely a significant factor. I guess a career as an elite athlete and the, the, the planning and the self-discipline that you have to impose upon yourself throughout your entire career has some positive transfer at the same time, doesn't it, in terms of what your next career is going to be? Did you find that your experience as an Olympian, as a record holder, that helped you? What did that transfer into your next career? Um, I think that the, the main things I found, or, or I guess one of the most significant things I noticed moving into the business world was, um, I guess, mindset, really, and just the behaviours that you um that you learn from pushing yourself on a daily basis and giving 100 percent i you know i've noticed that not everybody has those or the willingness to kind of go again or if you have one failure you sort of pick yourself up and, and go again and, and that's not as common as you assume it would be and certainly giving 100 percent or you know giving your best effort doesn't always appear to be um to be that common a lot of people you know, have a comfort zone and they won't ever push that comfort zone. So whilst in certain careers, you might not have all the knowledge and the skills, I think that can be learned, but the mindset and the behaviors that you have as a, an elite athlete are incredibly transferable because you are willing to learn and, you know, need, leave sort of no stone unturned. And I think that I've noticed that's helped me certainly in my business. And it's, it's the thing that I think most people in the general population need the most help with is mindset in order to build a business or whatever it is. I guess from, from a, from a different perspective, the, the amount of time that you spend as an athlete with your coach is, is critical, isn't it? In terms of this person being significant in terms of modeling or providing you with the kind of experiences and helping you to, to, to move on to your next career. Did, did your coach within Javelin help to play that role in terms of a mentor to try and guide you moving forward or did you get it from elsewhere? Um, yes, yeah, so I had coaches. I had several coaches in my career. So I'd always, um, I guess, you know, at some point you kind of in an individual sport outgrow your coach in many ways or they're, they're a specialist in, you know, developing athletes and then somebody else might be a specialist in the sort of elite end of performance. So I'd have a coach, but I'd also also have a mentor, which um, actually the research for the for athlete transition suggests that people really benefited from talking to somebody in their own sport um, about kind of athlete transition. But certainly in my career, um, I used Steve Buckley, who you know was wasn't too far away from me in age, um, but had achieved everything I wanted to, and so. I enjoyed and, and got a lot out of speaking to him and other athletes who, you know, won Olympic Games and, and did what I wanted to do. I always, if I had the opportunity to sit down with them and talk about, you know, what they did or how, what they thought high performance was and learnt from them. So, yeah, the co coaching side, certainly from a performance perspective, but if that coach isn't an ex-athlete, I found, you know, having both really beneficial. Sports science and sports psychology generally seems to have a, a growing presence w within elite professional sport. Um, something that I read within your thesis was, was and you touched upon visualization and affirmation in terms of planning your career. Do you want to just explain what you mean by those terms? Um, in terms of translate, I mean, certainly visualization I used a lot in my athletics career just because it's a completely closed skill. So the only person who can get in the way of a good performance is me. Um, and, you know, I used to have the ability to be able to start a stopwatch. My run up would from left foot contact to the block and release would take 4.45 seconds. And when I, my visualization and timing was kind of on point, I could get within a hundred for the second of um you know in a stopwatch of just visualizing it so that was almost a bit of a secret weapon when you couldn't necessarily physically train but you could you know mentally train as much as you could physically um and yeah i used to use affirmations at the back of the run-up because at the end of the day you've got to kid yourself that you're 
um, the best in the world, um, you know, as much as do the performance. So I'd certainly use them in a performance capacity. I'm not sure what I wrote in my dissertation around athlete transition and <laughs> visualization. Well, it's just, it was just interesting in terms of the, the correlation between what you did as an athlete and how those same kind of tricks, whether it be, you know, the brain visualizing a way to make things happen. And I think offline, we, we talked a little bit about uh, Hal Elrod and uh, the SAVERS acronym. And that's yeah. interesting because you, you transferred that into your business career, haven't you? Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so I, I just have a, um, I have a sort of morning set up. So every morning I'll just have a look at the goals that I've set myself for the year and the quarter and the week and, you know, what my, um, my sort of priorities are for the week in line with my goals. And then I'll, you know, do some meditation, visualization of, what I'm doing or say a difficult conversation I might need to have that day or whatever it might be and have some affirmations they're now very business related they're not juggling related at all um, and then I'll write in my kind of journal maybe lessons learned from the previous day or what I need to do today and then I'll read something sort of positive or just you know because I, I used to leave reading till late at night and then never you know want to read so now I read like 10 pages in the morning and you soon get through a lot more books than you would have done without reading. So, um, and then exercise and that's my morning routine. And I, you know, I do that every single day and, and it, it just kept, it helped me keep aligned with my goals. Um, and it's something I used to loosely do in sport. But I actually do it much more now in business, which, you know, is interesting in itself. Do you think that mindset that you have of, not just focusing on just purely athletics career and being able to juggle your academic career and now you've got a business career. Did that help in terms of making you a lot more optimistic and positive about your eventual end of your javelin career, moving into something new, having that multiple perspectives? Yeah, I think um, I've always, or well, certainly from a young age, I always did a lot of different things at school and, you know, sport and music and academia. Um, so I was always used to juggling things. And then actually when I became a, professional athlete I had less going on but I was still doing other things um, so now I certainly have kind of a portfolio career I guess where I do lots of different things and study as well if I can and have time and um, so yeah I think I certainly think being able to juggle different things and put different hats on is definitely beneficial um, for me I, I think I just I think sometimes opportunity can be disguised as hard work um, and so I tend to just say yes to everything, an opportunity that I'm offered within reason, I'll say yes to everything and then figure out how I'm gonna do it or deliver it later on. And I think that's a way of, or certainly that's what, that was my mantra when I retired, just say yes to everything and then you'll see what you don't like as much as what you do like. Um, and that's a way of building confidence and building your comfort zone and trying things that you perhaps hadn't done previously. And that certainly benefited me. Your MSc project had interviewees from, from a variety of different sports. Did you find there were big significant differences according to the kind of sport that an individual came from in terms of the national governing body support for that career transition? Um, it's difficult this. I don't know whether it's statistically significant. I found there were the, the, actually the common um, significant factors were the same across the board so that my sports that I interviewed were uh, professional rugby or sort of 15s, um, a sevens rugby player, athletics, hockey, swimming, gymnastics and rowing um, and actually they are all sort of friends of mine so I think that gave for a better more honest interview. Um, the athletes of which there are only two from athletics seem to have um, transitioned possibly worse maybe anecdotally than the other athletes. Um, I found the rugby players a bit more concerned about the financial implications of retiring, which was interesting, um, but seemed to do a bit more in terms of networking. Um, but whether that's because, you know, rugby is a little bit more commercial than Olympic sport, that might be the case. Um, and I think, you know, the men were a little bit more concerned by the financial costs associated of retiring but again that could be due to sort of gender roles but across the board it, it the same issues came up regardless of sport or gender I thought there might be more of a difference but actually 
what I found was there was, there was very little difference with everybody. You're obviously, still, you're obviously still in touch with, with a lot of current athletes. What are their concerns at the moment regarding coronavirus and the cancellation of events and the delay of events? Is that ramped up concerns about whether they have the financial means to, to transition when they want to move? Um, I think for the athletes that are funded, they're not concerned because I think they know their funding carries on for the next Olympics if and when it goes ahead in 2021. So there's, le there's not really a financial concern. I'm hoping that they start, the ones who are nearing sort of retirement age, I hope they st have found the time to start thinking about what they might want to do or when they might retire. I mean, I think I feel for the ones who kind of were a bit older and knew that they were going to retire after um, Tokyo and then an extra year is a long time at that stage of your career when you perhaps aren't funded because your performances might not be quite um, kind of up to scratch. So I think the main concerns at the moment just are around motivation and um, kind of going again and, you know, having effectively two years without good quality competition um, and also access to training centres, etc. So I think there's a huge kind of um, disparity between who's got what facilities to train in and access and that kind of thing. So. Um, but whether they're thinking about retirement, I'm not sure. I, I sort of fear they're not, probably. <laughs> what about for those athletes that are now starting to maybe prompted on the back of this conversation to start actually planning a little bit more clearly for their future post-athletics, post-professional sport? Are you able to fake it until you, until you make it? Because that's a common phrase. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think... I think one of the best things to do is just to spend time, if you can, with friends, family in careers or areas that you're interested in, um, or just ask, you know, some businesses, whether they were sort of old sponsors or commercial partners of a governing body, whatever it might be, just to go and sit and shadow people in different departments, because certainly when I retired and actually from the research, people don't just suddenly move into a career. There's, there's often a feeling, and this was something I experienced that you've done one thing for so long and been so focused on it. You don't suddenly want to go into another thing um, and solely focus on that. I think a lot of people get worried that they might choose the wrong thing. But to be honest, I think it takes a little while to decide what it is you want to do. But if you have the luxury of spending some time in industries just as much to find out what you don't want to do as much as you do because there are so many careers out there um, or it might be that you want to set up your own business I think you'll soon discover kind of what motivates you and what what doesn't in the world of work um, so but alongside that it does then make it quite critical that you've got a bit of funding behind you I'd maybe suggest like six months worth of living expenses whether that's mortgage or living expenses in order to be able to fund um, some time kind of playing around with what you do and don't want to do and, and, and often you'll need to do a course in something to get up to speed skill wise um, and really not also expecting to be on a salary that you perhaps were at the end of your sporting career which in the professional you know sports is going to be you know it's it's like inevitable that you're not going to be making the same amount of money that you did as an athlete and for some people that can be a bit of a shock but on the other hand i think you can rise through the ranks quite rapidly if you're willing and motivated i suppose ideally you'd find something that you love for your next career post professional sports but the catch-22 is that you've been so focused on your athletics career, on your, on your sporting career, that you probably don't know outside of that what you love. Is that a bit of a catch-22 for a lot of people? I think so. I think, um, yeah, that seems to be one of the, the kind of big problems. The, the, the athletes I interviewed who had done other things alongside their sporting career, whether that was just coaching or, um, you know, development work within their sport um they had then started to realize towards the end of their career that actually they enjoyed the coaching side of things it gave them another kind of identity i guess um and they then moved into that or put plans in place to, to move into that or set up 
kind of a training center or whatever it might be. Um, and also the research did find that a gradual sort of retirement. So one athlete um, was a player coach for a season before then becoming a coach to, to see if, you know, that's what he wanted to do. Um, the athletes that struggled were the ones that expected kind of doors to open and, and retired expecting people to come to them to give them work. And, and it doesn't always happen. I think you always obviously have to kind of make the first move and, and, and make people aware that, you know, whatever area it is that you're interested in, that's what you, you want to kind of do work experience or, or have an interview in that particular job, but just make contact a little bit earlier. Because I think a few athletes did mention that they felt that their stock was possibly a little bit more valuable um, or doors were opened whilst they were an athlete much easier and more um, more often when they were still an athlete rather than having been a retired athlete. But I don't know whether that was a perception or whether that was, was fact. Is it useful to start working on your personal brand when your status and your your reputation is at its highest when you're at your peak as a professional athlete is that the time to really optimize your your visibility in terms of your next career probably i mean yeah i mean social media wasn't so prevalent as it is now um for athletes but i think you know young athletes now are very used to having to to publicize themselves on social media you know even during events which we probably wouldn't have dreamt of doing and sort of seen it as a distraction but i think if athletes can show kind of another side of, to them you know of stuff that they're interested in then i think it might link more nicely to their to their retirement i'm definitely not a social media expert but all i know is it does work um, and you know brands and businesses certainly look at it much more but it's certainly practical things like you know getting up to speed on linkedin that kind of thing and that's all sort of things you can be doing um whilst you're still an athlete she so says what, so when, when were the seeds first sown for you in terms of your next career because obviously you've gone on to a highly successful career now in in property development and investment where did that all start from um, I think it was from experiences I'd had as an athlete. You know, I'd read a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, when I was about 21 and um, and sort of understood kind of leverage. And so basically had a, a buy-to-let property or lived in a house in Loughborough and then had to move for training. So rather than sell that house, I remortgaged it and bought another house in Cambridge. And then the same thing in London. And luckily for me, I'd bought in areas with significant capital growth. So um, when I retired, I had this kind of passive income from the rental properties that I owned, still owned um, from 2005. And so I thought, well, you know, this is giving me an income. Why don't I learn how to do this properly? So then did some property investing training courses with various different companies and mentorships and um you know hired a coach so i've effectively transposed my athletic career into another career um and just learned as much as i possibly could as quickly as i could and um you know i i think i was lucky and i found something that i loved and that kind of really inspired me and i could see myself building a business in that um so so really that's where that kind of journey started how do the two careers compare? Obviously, athletic career to post-athletic career. Do you do you miss the status? Do you miss the attention? Um, I think I miss, yeah, I certainly miss competing. Um, you know, if I could compete at my best, you know, I would carry on doing so forever, I think. But, um, you know, obviously injuries and age come into it at some point. I think the reason I love what I'm doing now is because... Um, you know, there is an element of risk involved in any purchase and um, or you, you might buy a house and you need to find the money and there's a bit of adrenaline involved anyway. And I think that was always something that I knew that I wanted from a career that there needed to be a, a level of risk involved because in Olympic sport or in any sport, you know, well, certainly from an Olympic perspective, you can have trained for four years for effectively three throws and about 13 seconds of work. So there's a lot of risk involved in 
dedicating yourself for four years and then you know you could get injured or you know have an awful performance so I think you know and also I, I mean I was almost feel sorry for you know footballers or rugby players who are playing in front of 60,000 people every weekend because you know you're not doing that in a in an office job certainly there's no there's no stage and I think that's what a lot of people miss from sport is the ability to perform which you don't have when you retire so I think that's where doing new things or trying you know different things to make yourself feel uncomfortable I think that possibly is what what a lot of athletes miss um status I guess you know you don't you don't ever lose that status as an Olympian or Olympic medalist. So I'm, I'm kind of happy with that, but I, I'm not somebody who goes around desperate to talk about my athletics career. I've very much put that in the past. And in a way I, I'm kind of, you know, glad that you know, people wouldn't know who I was. If it comes up, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm glad that I don't have to talk about, you know, doing something I did 20 years ago, which a lot of household names or Olympic gold medalists have to do um, on a, daily weekly basis so I think that helps a little bit there is you know research to suggest that actually the media and and possibly even friends and family don't necessarily let people transition um, because they still call them athletes or Olympians when they're very much now not an athlete so especially our household names so they almost don't have the kind of dual identity that they might want because people will always see them as Olympians or, you know, professional footballers or whatever it might be. So that certainly helps. Last question from me before we pass over to Tim, and I'm sure that Tim's got some questions from, um, from the audience. Has, to finish on a positive note, has your career as an Olympian and, a, and as a record holder, has that opened up doors that, that, somebody ordinary like myself would, would never get access to certainly after all your operations you must have access to the best surgeons on the planet i'm, I'm positive yeah. of that yeah. yeah my medical network is actually probably I, I do often um make calls to some of the best um elbow surgeons in the world um for other for other athletes um i think i don't know i don't because i'm you know i'm not an olympic gold medalist and you know household name I'm, i know that probably more doors would have been opened for me had I achieved what I wanted to in London, certainly, but got injured, you know, three weeks before. Um, but what it does do sport, it doesn't necessarily, well, for kind of mere mortals, it doesn't necessarily open doors, but it, it really helps with having something to talk about. So, um, you know, people in property who wouldn't know who I was, but, um, if they get wind that I'm an Olympic athlete, it then just gives you a talking point and makes you memorable, I think, just from having, I guess, another identity. So it's the same thing in, in business. You can turn it on its head and, and people are interested in people who have, like, like anybody is around a dinner table, if you do something interesting or you have a passion outside of your work, then people want to know about it. So it, I guess it just makes you memorable and a bit different to you know, another property investor or someone looking at a house. So, so it, I guess it's helped from that perspective. Um, and I think people are interested in sports people's mindsets. I often get asked about that or asked to do talks on that. Um, so, so yeah, it's certainly helpful, but I think you still have to do the work yourself. Things aren't, you know, don't fall in your laps, certainly. Right, well, you've certainly made a fantastic career change and a very successful career change. Really enjoy talking to. I'm going to pass you over to Tim now. So he's got some questions. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Uh, God, be really uh, transparent and honest. Really brutally honest about that. Some people will um, try and brush over it with a bit of an ego, but that was really clear um, and straight from the heart. So I think some of the questions, just picking up on um, on one of the questions that Ian just asked at the last bit, he says. Um, do you feel fulfilled um, that, that you reached the potential that you wanted to? And I'm guessing that's talking about your sport, your sporting career. And then I know you've already talked about the disciplines that you bring in from sport. Um, and there's a, there seems to be a relatively successful pattern that you brought around from the things that you learned from um, being at university and then um, progressing through into your sporting career. And then literally you're applying the same 
uh, discipline, strategy, and approach into your successful uh, property career right now. So the, 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 the question sits nicely with, do you feel that you've hit the potential that you wanted to, did you fulfill that? And um, uh, did you get it to the level that you wanted to? Do you think that's made it easier for your transition into retirement per se? Um, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Um, certainly the research um, that I did found that people who'd achieved what they wanted to in sport transitioned a bit easier than those who hadn't achieved what they wanted to in their sporting career. So I know in my um, research, there are a few people who'd finished fourth and fifth at Olympic Games, and actually that has really kind of eaten away at them. I've got a feeling I would have been the same had I not got the Olympic bronze medal which was awarded to me um much later like 11 years later after i won it in beijing i got it um, awarded retrospectively after the russian doping scandal and then perhaps that might have made retiring a bit easier because that was always a goal was to win an olympic medal um i mean i'll always you know retire knowing that i could have thrown further because that's inevitable i could have done and you know biomechanics suggests i should have done but you know things didn't always tie together and I think London was a huge disappointment for me, but again, you know, it's, it, you know, sporting careers don't always go how you want them to, but I think, yeah, your perceived level of success was a, bit, a big factor in retirement. So, and obviously if you've got a choice as to when you're going to retire um, and you're not deselected or you don't retire because of injury, that definitely helped as well. Um, as I mentioned, obviously that gradual transition. So, so yeah, I think the medal probably helped me. I feel, I mean, I certainly never thought I would win an Olympic medal, never thought I'd make a career from athletics when I was a kid. So I think when I retired, I just felt very grateful for the career I'd had. And then when you can identify the um, transferable skills, then you become even more grateful for having had that kind of training as an athlete, because you can then transfer those into another career. I think one of the difficulties is people don't always identify those transferable skills or employers don't always identify them. So you almost have to identify them for an employer. I'm lucky in that my, I'm kind of my own employer, so I don't have to tell myself what they are on a daily basis. But, um, but, but yeah, I think having employers who are aware of, you know, what it takes to be a professional athlete are definitely a, a, a good thing. Okay. Uh, well, Charlie from Edinburgh was asking, um, the mental health of retiring athletes is correctly a subject of much discussion right now. And I think just picking up on what you're saying, I think that with the level of um, it was maybe your choice or you felt that you were perhaps a bit more in control of it, you present yourself as someone who's been incredibly in control of your emotions. Now, you might say, well, that kind of looks like a swan on the surface, but peddling like hell underneath. Um, yeah. And the question <laughs> is, you know, are you going to be brave enough to say, was there ever a time when you, you, you actually mourned um you know that career because i know many many athletes talk about whether they've been a footballer or they've been in rugby or whatever or stepping into a boxing arena whenever there's a that you're never ever going to get past that you're never going to get that feeling of stepping out into that arena um then nothing ever uh, will compare to that so um the question was you know in secret did you ever mourn it yeah i mean certainly when i retired i was quite anxious i sort of felt um as I mentioned, like time was a bit running out. And I did, I did go and see a therapist just to, um, you know, get an objective view. I think a lot of people think that a counsellor or a therapist needs to understand sport. And I was someone who thought, well, they won't understand because, you know, how can you if you've not been an Olympic athlete or whatever? But I think, you know, you don't, it, it's, it's fairly obvious, you know, the differences between a sporting career and, a, and an alternative career. Um, so, yeah, I guess that was probably... Yeah, I, I guess well. you sort of more you go through the grieving process. I guess it's like that sort of curve, isn't it? You just want to flatten out the peak of that curve. And I think I had people around me to help me do that. I think you know the research, and from my perspective, friends and family are, are critical. But I think where a lot of maybe team sports might be worse. But if your whole social circle revolves around your team when you retire and those other players carry on, you know, into the next season, yeah. they don't understand what retiring's like because you don't think about it until it happens. So if you don't have friends outside of sport, when you retire, your support network kind of retires with you and then 
and that's where I think people can kind of go wrong. So yeah, I think I've certainly, I've probably mourned the loss of, yeah, maybe a professional career, but I don't think I went through it to quite the same degree as some people did. I think because when I go through the you know significant factors from my dissertation, I think I hit all of those things. I'd done all those things. I felt supported. I had a sort of dual identity. Um, you know, I had the support network to help me. I felt like I'd you know hit a level of success that I was happy with. Um, I'm not the best at asking for help, but I did. You know, I went and you know saw somebody when I wasn't feeling great. Um, Something that we haven't talked about yet, but is seen as a positive and ne negative for people transitioning. When I first retired, the sense of freedom was amazing. And this headspace kind of opened up that I didn't know existed because I'd been so focused on one thing. I then felt like I had so much time for kind of friends, family, other things. And that was great. But then once the initial sense of freedom and excitement of retiring wears off, um, it can become, and it, you know, all the other people I interviewed said that the freedom then became quite difficult because you had that lack of structure that you off, off, you know, you had in your playing career um, where you knew what you were doing every single day. When you don't have that, then that feeds into that loss of identity a little bit, I think. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the loss of identity and, and the, um, the not being the best at asking for help. What, what, what made you stop and go, do you know what, I, I need to, or I want to go and see someone to help me realign these thoughts, you know, were the tears involved? What was the, what was the, what was the catalyst for you making that decision? Um, I think I'd, I'd sort of had to come to terms with it over probably a whole Olympic cycle actually, in that, you know, I had career threatening injuries, so there were definitely um, tears involved in that. And so, and, and I guess like there was a few points where I sort of thought that my career was about to be over. So I'd kind of, I guess, been on the periphery of retiring for a few years um so i guess i just i i guess i reached out for help probably when i knew that the athlete identity wasn't there anymore um which probably makes you or certainly help me ask for help because i then wasn't an athlete anymore and and you know i don't know why but that might have made it different i'm not sure why i did i guess okay you know, I've got friends who are therapists and things like that, so it's it's not you know unusual. And I know that I think if everybody could afford to have therapy, the world be, would probably be a better place. So it was just a few sessions for a period of time to kind of understand why I was feeling anxious because I couldn't quite work it out really. Well, did you go see did you go see someone that you knew, or did you go see see someone that was completely independent, um, knowing where you were? I mean, clearly you've got friends that are, that'll do this. So come and talk to me anytime. Or did you make a d deliberate choice to go and seek someone out that could actually give you the independent advice you were looking for? No, is it someone in, definitely independent? Yeah, no, the friends who are therapists definitely aren't therapists. <laughs> Perfect. That's, um, which leads nicely on to the last question before I hand over to Tony. I know Tony's got a few coming in from around the world, so um, um, I know he's translating a little bit. To what extent then has your further studies, um, particularly the DSI programme, contributed to your post-career development? Because you, you mentioned all the time about constantly being in something to develop yourself or, or in a course or I understand you're doing a, a coaching uh, qualification now and things like that so there's always that element for you of, of developing and progress how's the program helped you um, I mean I think I was really interested to do the um, sporting directorship masters because I, I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to go back into sport in an administrative capacity or I was always a bit frustrated if there was kind of systemic problems in sport because um, I guess I think a bit kind of big picture so there was I, I guess I did it to see if I, a, I wanted to do it and b it was something to do to then help me at a later date if I did then want to move back into sport but I always had the sense that it was kind of healthy coming out of sport and doing something different to then maybe go back in with a kind of new skill set anyway but I think you know what makes a good team you know dynamic is the same in in kind of any industry it's just a slightly nuanced position in sport so um so good leadership is good leadership in in kind of any industry but i really enjoyed the program um i certainly wanted to do a dissertation in something 
that I was interested in and that could perhaps help people, which is why I did the athlete transition piece because you know it was a it was a kind of hot topic it still is um but i just wanted to get some research on high level athletes because there's a lot of research out there but it's always on kind of national international level athletes but I, these are all people who have been to olympic games rugby world cup so which could bias the results a little bit but um i just felt like i wanted to sort of give something back and it was an opportunity to do that Okay, well, I, and I'll, I've just got one final bit because the question I'm asking myself is, you sound like you've got, you've not finished with sport yet. It sounds like there's still a vendetta. There's something that, you, that you're going to do, deliver, leave a legacy on or whatever. If there's a magic wand that kind of went bang, that's, that's what I'm going to do before. That's what people are going to remember me for, not just uh, the things that I did on Olympic stage, but this is what the impact, you know, the thing that you're really passionate about, what would that be? Um, oh, good question. Um, there's, uh, there's definitely a part of me that would like to, certainly in sport, something that would really fascinate with me would be taking a lower league, um, you know, say football team through the divisions, because I think if you can, you know, apply, certainly Olympic sport has a lot of, um, there's a lot of things in Olympic sport that I think professional sport could do better or learn. It's not necessarily they're doing it worse, but it, I think we don't test, tend to cross pollinate sports enough. Um, so there's, I think, areas that could be improved in different sports that they could learn from other sports. Um, so yeah, just building, I, I'm really fascinated in, you know, club systems whilst I wasn't necessarily in a team sport, making a sports organization as high performing as possible is something that in a, in, in a culture is, is high performing as possible is something I'm really passionate about, whether I ever take the plunge and do it but that's a that's definitely a big job i'm sure i'm sure the opportunity will arise and, I, and i'm and I, i'm sure you've already aware ian's written a, a book that's particularly specialist and most helpful in it um thank you so much for asking those questions with clarity and um, and, and real passion uh, tony i know you've got some questions can i hand this over to you my friend goldie so we had uh, i had four questions that came in but three of them have all been asked so <laughs> so we, we've got a question here from um jacinda who is actually a javelin thrower over in South Africa. And actually, you've just started to touch on a certain part of the question. She's asking, did you ever look outside of your sport to find inspiration? Um, it's a good question. Um, I did, but actually in hindsight, I kind of I possibly wish I'd maybe taken a few more risks in terms of possibly training methods from other sports. There was a period where I was going to do a lot more sort of gymnastics type training um, to see if it would have helped. And then I think I got injured and sort of parked that idea for a bit. Um, I think there's so much, the, the difficulty now is there's so much information out there and online and, you know, rivals will start posting stuff that they do. And they're inevitably going to be posting videos of things they do well not badly um, and I think there can be a bit of information overload so for me it was all of, always about trying to understand what I do well and what makes me good and try and maximize those strengths whilst working on the weaknesses I say that now I think I spent most of my career trying to work on my weaknesses and and not really identify I identified it but I didn't realize probably how good I was at the things I did well um, I think there's definitely definitely benefit in looking at what other sports do and seeing in trying things um, I think and maybe just taking a few more risks and not doing stuff just because that's how it's always been done which I think is is the case in so many different sports you see warm-ups that are dreadful but that's just because that's what we do um, and just in kind of asking questions and and um, I think the main thing is understanding why you perform well and what you need to improve is the, the biggest thing. And if you don't know yourself, then asking people close to you who you trust um, what you do well is, is definitely beneficial. Goldie, yeah. that's fantastic. Um, really enjoyed your time. We're coming up to the hour mark, so we appreciate your, your, your time this afternoon. Um, if any further questions come in, are we okay if we send them across to you? 
yeah we can we can get them out now yeah but appreciate your time it's been really interesting we've got great feedback coming through on the screen so uh from vsi thanks very much and and we'll be in touch soon great thank you see you guys